Hello, everyone. This is our second session of the day, Phragmite Symposium 2, Future Directions for Research and Management. Uh, our first presenter today is Samantha Tank, and she'll be talking about the Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework, PAMF, Managing Phragmites with Science on Your Side. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, welcome, everyone. I hope you were able to join us for our first session, but this is the second session that is being hosted by the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. My name is Samantha Tank, and I work for the Great Lakes Commission. And one of my charges at the commission is to coordinate PAMP for the Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework. So before I get started, I do want to acknowledge my co-authors, so Patrick Ganeff and uh, Erica Jensen at the Great Lakes Commission with me, uh, Christine Dumlin at University of Georgia, and then Clint Moore and Kirk Kowalski, who you will hear from in just a little bit at USGS. I'd also like to acknowledge um, our funder, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and the entirety of the core team, most of them I just mentioned, but I'm all do a special shout out to Tasha Taka as well, as well at USGS, and then the technical working group, which actually our moderator, Jason, um, was a member of. So um, if you were at the last session, you heard a little bit about uh, the different ways that we're trying to manage Phragmites. So there's herbicide treatments, there's mechanical removal, there's prescribed burns, and even hydrologic manipulations. And the one thing that all of these have in common is that they are highly resource intensive. And another thing that they tend to have in common, unfortunately, is there's variable effectiveness given site-specific conditions of Phragmites stands or the implementation techniques. Um, and so how managers are choosing to apply different management actions. And so something like a glyphosate treatment that works really well in Michigan might not work so well um, if you go over to Minnesota. And we're not exactly sure why that is. So there's a lot of uncertainty that exists surrounding Phragmites management. Um, but even when we do have these really great techniques that we want to get out there and we want to share or we're having a lot of success, we don't have a mechanism currently in place that really allows us to easily share this information. And then even among experts who have decades of Fragbites um, management and research under their belts, they still don't necessarily agree with each other on what's going to be the most effective management technique under um, certain conditions. So we had to ask ourselves at the collaborative, what, what can we do better? So it seemed clear that we needed some sort of system scale approach. There's a lot of um, isolated management efforts that are happening. It might be you know, one stand of Phragmites or it might be county level or it might even be state level, but is that really enough? Can we do something more than that? Um, we also acknowledge that there's a lot we know, but we do have a lot more to learn. There's still that uncertainty that's surrounding us, and we want to find ways to reduce that. And to do that, we're going to have to reduce this trial and error approach to management, where we go out and we implement one technique, and that didn't work, so okay, what's our, uh, what's our plan B? We don't want to um, continue down that path. And hopefully that will help us answer the questions of why are some management techniques working in one areas and others not? And then how can we optimize the timing of our management actions so that they're most effective and efficient as well? And so this is where the idea for PAMF came from. So um, PAMF has been around since it started in the development around 2016. Um, in 2017, it really got off the ground. So this is a collaboration between um, the University of Georgia, the Great Lakes Commission, and USGS, and um, led by the technical working group. And um, it's something that we're really proud of to share with you today. And we hope that um, once you hear this, you'll be interested and you'll, you'll want to join our program too. So as the name suggests, um, Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework is an adaptive management program, and we do use the US Department of the Interior's definition. So that's a systematic approach for improving resource management by learning from our management outcomes. So the key there is learning. 
And when adaptive management is done correctly, one of the outcomes is that we're learning in a way that we can um, apply those lessons learned to reduce our uncertainty overall. Um, and the uncertainty that I'm talking about is that surrounding management techniques that I referenced earlier. So why are we not seeing the same results all over or why are we not having the same effectiveness year after year? Um, and then through adaptive management, we can make more strategic decisions and reduce this trial and error approach to management and improve our overall effectiveness of management and reduce wasting our limited resources. So it's not just the core team. I've mentioned the technical working group a couple of times. They came together and they were really essential for the development um, and the design behind the program. And these are the um, 11 agencies who helped us with that. But we're just between the technical working group as the developers and the core team as the administrators, we're just kind of the behind the scenes folks. PAMF is a program meant for managers. And so it really only works if we have participants. And a participant in PAMF can be anyone in the Great Lakes Basin um, or surrounding watersheds that's managing or planning to manage non-native Phragmites. So you might think, okay, well, how can you engage a private landowner at the same time that you can engage a federal agency? Well, hopefully it will become a little more clear as I go through the ins and outs of it. So in addition to adaptive management, PAMP uses collective learning to reduce this trial and error approach to management. Um, and so what happens is we're asking participants around the basin to collect data in a systematic way and then send it to us. And then we have a way to analyze that data and learn from it. And in return, participants get um, site-specific guidance. So each of the different stands of Phragmites that they enroll are going to get unique guidance specific for them that is based on our regional learning and um, is going to be our prediction of what's going to be the most effective and efficient for their site. So there's some programs out there that use adaptive management and there's some programs out there that use participatory science, but PAMP is this really unique and kind of perfect combination of the two. And um, that's one thing that I think has been making it so successful. So to give you an idea of what adaptive management looks like kind of in practice by um, our participants, what they do is they enroll a site of Phragmites that um, they're intending to manage. And then we give them a set of monitoring procedures. And so they go out, monitor, collect that data, send it to us. And we have a um, very uniquely designed model that's able to analyze that data. And as its output, it provides guidance for each site that's enrolled. So that guidance is then sent out annually to all of our managers. And then the managers can go ahead and implement that guidance track what management actions that they're actually implementing on the ground, send that um, to us along with monitoring data next year, and then this cycle starts all over again. I wanted to break down each of the steps a little bit more. So when I say enrolling a site, um, if you take a look at this map right here, this is off of our website. So everything that happens um, for a participant happens on our web hub, which is our central database for all of their management units live, all of their um, past reports live, everything is, is nice and in one location for them. And participants go out and choose a site that they're going to enroll. We don't have any size limitations. So we have sites that are a quarter of an acre or less and sites that are, I think our largest is over 150 acres. So we have a huge variety of sites enrolled in PAMS. Um, and They'll go out either map with a GPS unit or they can use a feature on our website that allows them to draw a polygon and then they answer just some basic background questions. So once the site is enrolled, um, participants are able to monitor and monitoring happens annually in July. And so there's a month long window where participants go out and they use um, our monitoring kit, which 
consists of a quarter meter squared quadrat, a set of veneer calipers, and then some data sheets. The only thing they have to provide is um, a GPS unit. We just generally encourage if, if they're not um, from an agency or not doing invasive species work um, regularly, that they just use their cell phone and we have instructions for how to do that. So we have lots of training resources because like I said, this is a program where a private landowner can engage with us or a federal agency or well, we have a lot of state agencies actually um, who engage with us. And so their experience level is going to be completely different. So the um, training resources are meant to give them an overview and help them understand why we're monitoring and what techniques they need to implement. Um, and the monitoring itself is designed to be simple enough that anyone can do it without you know, a master's degree, but robust enough that our model is able to learn from the parameters that we're collecting data on. So when we're collecting monitoring data, what we're trying to do is get an idea of how invaded a site is. And so the model looks at two different um, measures. It looks at stem density or the number of live stems per that quadrat area. Then it looks at percent establishment. So over the entirety of the management unit, how what's the proportion of the management unit that is established with live Phragmites? And this gives us six different states of invasion, one being the lowest state of invasion, and then six being the highest state of invasion. And this is what the model uses um, to, along with some additional optimization to um, provide guidance. I did mention trainings. We have had to make some adjustments this year. So in the past, one really part, fun part of my job was I got to travel around the Great Lakes and give in-person trainings. Um, and we, we hosted by a variety of different agencies and organizations. But this year we had to rethink a little bit and we had to take our what was historically a really engaging program, um, a lot of it in person, to being completely remote. So we moved all of our training resources online and are currently in the process of developing a, um, a training, uh, I think we're gonna use Moodle and, and use a more kind of complete training resource. Um, but right now there's something that you can visit the website and you can work through these modules at your own pace. All of it only takes about two hours. It's really, there's not a lot of work to, to learn the ins and outs of PAM. Um, we were also able to, because we knew a lot of our managers weren't actually able to even get out into the field this year and monitor their sites just because of time restrictions or um, COVID restrictions. And so, we actually did offer some monitoring assistance. And you can see two sites here. Actually, if you saw Charlotte's presentation in the last session, you saw a lot more PAMP sites, but you can see the huge variety. This one's in a wetland area and this one's under an overpass. So the model is um, what I keep mentioning, and it's actually um, a series of code that Christine has developed and um, from the University of Georgia, she's one of the co-authors. And what the model does is it takes predictions from previous years and it uses that as a prior. And it um, incorporates all of the management and monitoring reports that participants have submitted this current year. So how has a site changed based on the different management actions that were implemented? And it is able to update and have a new set of probabilities on, okay, what is it, what's going to be the most likely outcome if you apply X management technique. We also then apply some optimization to the model where we um, look at how much all of these actions are generally costing. And then we make sure that we're balancing both effectiveness and efficiency to provide our PAMP guidance. So guidance is kind of a, a tricky thing when you have such a broad program with so many different, um, different participants and, and different levels of experience. So our guidance looks like one optimal combination that they can implement and then a series of near optimal combinations. And what we tell them is go ahead and implement glyphosate during the translocating phase and we have date ranges for those. 
um, a maybe a pre-flood clear in the dormant and a flood in the growing. This is likely to give you the best results and be the most efficient. What we don't say is go out with a 2% glyphosate concentration using a backpack sprayer with these surfactants and you know make sure you use dye. We don't give them all of the specifics. And in that way, we are able to broaden ourselves to a variety of capabilities, right? So if we gave this guidance to a private landowner, they're going to need to hire a, a contractor and able to implement these. And we have resources available to help them um, work through those decisions. However, if we gave this to a state agency, well, they likely have um, protocols in place for how they treat with herbicides or how they implement a flood. So that's why the guidance is so simplistic. And what they do is participants go out and apply this guidance and they manage. And the reports that they submit back to us, well, that's where we get all of the information on what concentration of herbicide did they use or what time of year did they do their um, mechanical removal and what equipment did they use to do that. And so we can get all of that information and analyze that on the back end. And that's part of our postdoc analysis. And all of this happens on this iterative cycle. So it happens each year, participants continue to monitor the same sites or enroll new sites. If there's no more Phragmites at the ones that um, they have monitored in the past or that they've had enrolled in the past. And it's just meant to continue on. And this program is, we're hoping to be around until there's no more Phragmites left, which is a tall goal, but we need a program like this in order to assure this is possible. We do have partners from all over the basin right now. Um, I think there's, as of right now, 201 enrolled management units that are managed by 66 managers. And we have units in all eight Great Lakes states and Ontario as well. I mentioned the uh, diversity of our partners. So here's all of the um, general groupings of organizations that we have engaged so far. A lot of our engagement comes from um, state government, but we are starting to get more grassroots and individual um, participants as well. So I just really wanted, quickly wanted to share with you some of the results. We don't have enough data to provide meaningful results, but we, um, at this time, at least more broadly, we do have enough data to provide meaningful guidance, but not to make broad statements. We need additional data for that. So um, each year we do some post-hoc analysis and look at what guidance has gone out. And so this is the guidance that went out this year. Here's all of our different management actions. And here are they grouped by states of invasion. What's really important at this time, and so this is a map, or this is a figure that just shows the years, um, and then it's the same breakdown as the other figure is that our data is, or that our guidance is changing each year. So you can see that the guidance that went out in 2018 doesn't look a lot like the guidance that went out in 2020. And that's really showing how we are learning as a program and how we are um, able to take that data into our model and our model is continued progressing and hopefully we'll see it coalesce in the next couple of years. So I wanted to finish out the presentation by just talking about where we're going to in the future. Today we released our PAMP strategic plan. Um, if you go on our website, you can check that out. And this is going to help guide the program into the next five years. And after that time, we are going to um, uh, continue PAMP until there's no more frag left. I know I'm running low on time, but I wanted to put my contact information out there. So if you're out there in the Great Lakes region managing Phragmites, I'd really like to have a conversation about PAMP or encourage you to get involved. You can find us um, at the link right here, or you can just send an email to us at either one of these email addresses. So thanks so much. So we have less than a minute for questions, but really briefly, is there any guidance on how to prioritize sites based upon their size? Actually, I know that um, Wisconsin was working on 
um, something like that. We don't have anything in PAMP, but if you send me an email, I can put you in contact with who I know is working on that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks so much. So for our next speaker, it's Kurt Kowalski. He's going to be speaking about targeting gene expression to develop species-specific approaches to manage non-native Phragmites. Oh, all right, can you hear me? Excellent, now you can, correct? Jason, you can hear me all right? I, I can, can hear, hear you. you. All right, thank you, sorry, fooling with the button. Hey everybody, I'm Kurt Kowalski, I'm a research wetland ecologist at the US Geological Survey Great Lakes Science Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and happy to uh, talk to you today about some of the work we're doing on genetic biocontrol. Certainly wanna recognize my co-author, um, Dr. Ping Gong at the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and what everything I'm talking about here today has been funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and some USGS funding as well. So uh, we certainly appreciate that support. So if you're only sticking around for one minute, here, here are the take-home messages, and hopefully this gets built out through time. So as has been talked about throughout the um, the rest of this session, uh, we have. Uh, Known that Phragmites is a big problem, binational problem, and the conventional tools just aren't cutting it. Um, Michael just made a great argument for that. And so we've been working on some new tools based on um, collaborative work to develop the species specific, non heritable um, treatments based on RNA interference. And our progress, our current focus right now is looking at cell penetration, trying to get the, the constructs into the cells, and uh, working to optimize the inhibition of gene expression. So let me talk about each of those um, uh, throughout the rest of the presentation here a little bit more. So if you've been around for, for both sessions and, you know, and you're here because you, you know something about Phragmites, uh, that's, uh, you know, these, this is uh, repeat information, but I think it's important for all of us to just kind of be on the same starting point. To remember that it's a grass, remember it's very invasive, it has this huge rhizome system, a whole lot of above ground biomass. And uh, there is a native, to North America, that's important to keep in mind, but it's that ing invasive genotype that we've already heard about and talking about that's causing most of the issues. Huge impacts on ecosystem from upsetting hydrology and biodiversity, and you know, through those and more directly impacting people. Fire, fire threat, aesthetics, upper right hand corner there, that's a two story house, you know, that's a, a beach on the Great Lakes. So you can see big impacts on people and therefore it's, it's a big priority for lots of different management agencies. The map you see here in green, EDMAPS data from a little while back representing the native Phragmites. So they are fairly extensive, but the reality is that uh, the invasive or non-native Phragmites is what's causing all the problem. And it's really a North America problem. And that's why you see it appear in so many different action plans and various um, um, yeah action plans, strategic plans, those types of things that really represent that it is a high priority federal level, state level, provincial level, and uh, property owners and so on. So it's a big issue that you know, all of us are working on and thinking about. Current tools in the toolbox as have been discussed, and oftentimes it's herbicide, glyphosate, or mazapir, or combinations of um, to, to spray, if you're able to do that, like you are in the US. Uh, we can, Use hydrology, you can flood it uh, as an option if, again, the physical site allows it. Mechanical, you can cut it or crush it, which generally might make you feel good, but uh, doesn't have a, a big long term impact on the control of the species. And then fire is also another tool. And there's lots of folks working on and talking about different combinations of these that are going to be optimal and part of what PAMP is about. But all of these are very resource intensive and not species specific. So they're not just targeting. Um, Phragmites impacts on a lot of the native species uh, that might be trying to regrow there or growing a lot in with the Phragmites. Then there's uh, this ongoing question of what comes after the treatment um, so that we can optimize treatments to, to maximize that outcome that you're looking for. So again, as Michael talked about tools in the toolbox, this way I think about it as well. So we've been thinking about what new tools can we add to this mix of options for managers. And so um, the first thing, as we were thinking about new tools, started thinking about, all right, well, what makes Phragmites so dominant? Well, you know, it's really tall, as we talked about, it's really dense stems, vigorous root and rhizome system. That's a, a rhizome that my colleague, Mike, I listed is holding there in the upper right-hand corner, 
high seed output from those seed heads. And all of these traits have a genetic basis. So we're thinking, all right, well, can we switch them off and limit the expression of those traits that make it so competitive and outcompete the native plants? So that's how we came down the path thinking about genetic biocontrol. And unlike uh, what you heard about um, earlier, I, I wasn't able to attend, but I saw there was a session on Tuesday about genetic biocontrol. Uh, most of those discussions uh, looked like they were about um, DNA and, and focused on the organism, organism's DNA and processes that we can use to um, target uh, whether it be plants or, or other organisms. What I'm talking about today for genetic biocontrol is focused on RNA. And so that differs in that we're not addressing or altering the DNA, just blocking expression of those traits, blocking expression through the RNA process. And that also means that the, the impacts are transient. There's nothing there to carry on to the next generation. So think of it like a, a bio herbicide. Um, and this is how we envision it because it doesn't exist yet as a, as a tool, but we envision it more like a bio herbicide because it's affecting one generation um, of the plant. And we're targeting these, these key processes for synthesis, flower development, root development, again, things that help make it so competitive. And ultimately we'll be uh, thinking about and continue to test for reduction in that, that, um, in that competitive edge that it has. What is gene, gene silencing? I, I like, really like to use this cartoon and some of you may have seen it before. I think it's pretty effective though. So this, this explains what's going on. So we have a gene, right? That's the, the DNA. And uh, part of the natural process here is that you have transcriptions. You get the single stranded RNA, uh, messenger RNA that then gets translated into proteins that then create the traits um, in, the, in the plant. If we want to limit the expression of certain traits, we can work backwards here and then eliminate the protein and target that, um, that RNA. So that's what we're looking at here with this gene silencing. And what we know already, and it's been well shown and, and um, experimented on uh, through time, is that RNA interference is a natural process that happens in plants where they naturally, as a defense mechanism, they degrade suspicious um, RNA that enter their system. And this was first articulated by uh, Napoli et al. in the paper in 1990. They were looking at petunias. Here. And I'll take example, purple petunia. And they were looking at bedding plants. Hey, we want a more purple petunia because then you might get a better price for it or a better product, right? So they said, all right, let's add some mRNA coding for purple, kind of the code purple, double-stranded <laughs> RNA to get a more purple flower. And it came out white. And like, Okay, what's going on? So they dug into it, and that's where they realized that there's this natural process where the plant identifies these suspicious double-stranded RNAs and then attack it, degrade it, and then also degrades all the complementary single strands of RNA. So we go back to this diagram and, and start um, adding a gene silencing vector uh, construct, uh, a double-stranded RNA, and let's just call it the one for photosynthesize, right? So we add this to the the plant, get it in the plant, it's gonna say, whoa, we got an invader here. It sends out some dicer proteins and takes care of that double-stranded RNA, which then also takes care of single-stranded the protein, and then you get a plant that doesn't photosynthesize. So this is the process that we're thinking about for invasive plants, but it's already been um, published on and is used in other ways. You may have heard it's, used, it's being used to develop gene therapies for human health. Um, there's you know, numerous examples out there now um, of using similar approaches to um, delimit the expression of, of certain um, pathogens or, or certain traits that are causing disease in humans. Also used in the food system, Arctic apples is an example, um, have, have been uh, developed to limit the amount of browning that occurs, same type of process. So we are taking this and thinking about an invasive species context. And as we're doing so, part, strong partnerships with um, Ed Goldenberg at Wayne State University and, and again, Ping Gong and his team at the Corps of Engineers. And so early work by um, at Wayne State was um, thinking about, all right, well, uh, we have this process that we know about. We've tested it in, um, in spinach leaves and, and uh, testing out different vectors because it's one thing to identify the construct or the genetic target that you're trying to the target, but it's also how do you get it into the plant? And so the early experimentation was with some of these model species of uh, working on spinach. Uh, and in this example, you can see through the pictures, we're able to silence the creation of the development of the 
um, reproductive organs of spinach. So the slide up there, the image on the right there, you can see are sterile. So basically made the spinach flower sterile for this process. We took that, developed it in, in using some of these model species, using um, uh, maize um, species, testing different vectors, right? So we're testing agrobacterium, some different forms to try to get it into the plant cells. That's really proving to be uh, a big challenge. So we have the constructs and we have the, <clears throat> the vector. So let's put that in a little conceptual diagram to help you out here, because the goal is the gene silencing for Phragmites, right, as a management tool. So to get there, it's the work I'm talking about with Wayne State University to, to build that the genetic database and work on those constructs, those targets for uh, silencing. But then we also need to continue to work on the vectors. And this is where um, the, the Corps of Engineers really um, started joining this project. And, and again, um, and Peng Zhang's um, team to identify new ways of getting these constructs into the plant cells. So looking at the vectors, screening those, putting those together, right? So you're getting the product and getting it in, and then we're scaling up to test effectiveness and feasibility in the field and getting to that reality of having a tool in managers' hands. Well, let's talk about, let me talk a little bit more about the vector process side of things right now. So um, one of the things that, um, ha, that the core had been working on was these cell penetrating peptides. And they were um, thought to be, again, continue to be a potentially good vector um, for attacking Phragmites. Again, taking these vectors and getting, putting a payload on them and getting them into the plant. Had good success, uh, tobacco and rockcress, some other plants. So we thought, okay, let's work on that within Phragmites since there's already a track record. So we uh, have tested several different CPP, the cell penetrating peptide candidates. Um, you can see them listed there and several different payloads. So um, first off, a fluorescent label, just to see physically, can you see, are these vectors getting into the plant cells where they need to be, that's where the RNA has to get to, to um, interfere with the, with the process. So we just a couple different genetic codes and, and really exploring this first question of making sure we're getting the constructs into the payload. And so we, we did that by, um, I want to do that process quickly by using um, you know, a cryostat, so using freezing leaf tissue, doing some cross-sectioning, and looking at it under a fluorescing uh, fluorescence microscope. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides to show you what that looked like and some of the results we're getting. So the image you see there, some of the plant, um, plant parts um, uh, labeled in the bright field. So that's just white light um, on that cross-section of these are Phragmites cells. And then or some microscope lets you amplify. So that's what you see there. You can start to see uh, where within the plant cells and within the vascular bundles and within the, the leaf and by the vectors are, are getting the, the payload. So here we have another bright field. So that's in just white light, but by using fluorescent field and that fluorescent label that I talked about, we're able to see then, um, see things in a little bit different way. And so the next several images uh, we have, unfortunately they're green and red, hopefully you're able to, to see these, but this is how they come out. So the background signal is in red. So that's uh, just the normal cells, but the payload um, are, is in green. So we start to zoom in on that a bit at 40X and then 60X, you can start to see that those green dots, which represent the fluorescent construct on a CPP vector are being delivered into the um, vascular bundles and getting into the plant cells. Good, that's good stuff. So we're happy, very happy with um, seeing that. And if this um, works for you, this is actually a, a 3D animation, several images that are just strung together, but what you see, should see is that cross section getting rotated. So what it does in, in this image, the, the uh, payload is red, the other one is green, but you see those dots. And as you can see, the cross section turns. It's not just in the, the top of the leaf, the bottom leaf. There's no spatial organization to it. It's systemic throughout the leaf. Again, a good, um, a good indication that we're making some progress. So we'll, uh, we're doing that, continuing to do that as we work through this, this project flow. So again, we're, we're preparing these um, constructs and payloads, um, these putting them together, treating Phragmites, visualizing the internalization or uptake of the treatments, measuring the, then the gene expression. So we saw it in the cells, but then does it actually have an impact on the plant? Are we seeing a, a physiological response by the plant? Going back to optimize 
the CPB and the middle stranded RNA and repeating that until we get to um, some solid repeatable um, good, uh, construct combinations that have the optimal effect. So I'm gonna kind of finish things up here uh, a little bit with this discussion about this is our roadmap. So you saw where we're at right now with the, developing the constructs and the complexes. We're continuing to, um, to do that. We're very actively working on it up through the spring. And of course the pandemic hit, difficult to be in a lab for a while. So we're getting back at things. But this image gives you an idea of where we are in the big process to go from an idea to you know, actually having something that you can buy or apply or, or, or use within the field. We're um, generally in the left two columns here. So if you have, if you see the genetic code um, and the vector, those are the two things I talked about the most here on the left-hand side of the slide. And underneath those, you can see some of the things that we had tested, um, some of the different constructs of the CPPs, the different uh, microRNAs and artificial microRNAs and working with those vectors. Again, within the blue box, blue oval there actually, um, to optimize that combination of construct and vector, and then start to, like in the purple box, start to scale that up and think about, okay, how do we get that from this very small scale to testing in, in a greenhouse? And then ultimately be able to scale up in you know, mesocosm testing and in field testing and test plots. And so, uh, that's where we're at right now. We've done, as you saw in some pictures, or testing in the greenhouse, testing in the lab, um, working through those, indiv those individual phases. Because then as we go to the right, the less built out part of this, uh, we are fully aware of and are thinking and are working on the, the regulatory process and what's gonna be needed. Uh, once we do um, get it all sorted, get the science all sorted out, what are we gonna need to be able to uh, make sure we um, you know, test all the the different concerns that might come with this from you know, the host specificity to the, the half-life or how long it lasts, how you apply it, how, you know, how often, all those types of things, how it gets registered. Those are all things that um, we're continuing to, to work on a bit, but we'll get developed more with time. And then kind of that final column is, is the scaling up part of it, uh, making it uh, viable to uh, produce at a, at a larger scale and manufacturing it and, Thinking about cost and, and, and all those types of things. So this is the, the progress that we're, we're working on now, pulling in partners and um, developing different uh, relationships as we go through here, um, working towards that end goal of kind of add another tool that is um, hopefully you know, species specific, it's transient and offers some different opportunities for application in certain situations, maybe where there's um, a lot of other more desirable plants and there's just a few plants that we're targeting Maybe shortly after there's a restoration and there's a reinvasion by Phragmites might be an opportunity. Those are the types of uh, applications we think might be reasonable to, to think about and we'll be continuing to test those into the future. And so with that, again, I'll leave you with our um, email addresses here. I think there might be just a short bit of time for questions. Please reach out if you have thoughts or ideas outside of this presentation. Happy to talk about those. Thank you. You've got two and a half minutes for questions, <clears throat> and we haven't had any from the audience. But one question that I have is, how do you test the vectors so that they are specific to Phragmites? So that would be the the host specificity, essentially, right? So uh, that's how I'm interpreting your question. And that would be once we get it refined and we get it optimized with Phragmites, I would envision a process where we go through and similar to the, the biocontrol, where you introduce it and and test it by applying it to other plants and seeing if there's uh, a uh, not only the ability to get it into another plant, but if the genetic code is different, it's not going to line up with another species and thus be you know have zero effect. So so that's the idea of the geno um, or host or the species specific part of it is the genetic code. And these constructs are very small. And so we think it's going to be quite species specific as we develop it, but they're great questions that we have to test to make sure that when you're applying it, that you're you know, having the desired effect and doesn't have any off species effects. Great. Um, looks like we're not having any further questions from the audience and I don't have any questions myself. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all.
So we've got about a minute between presentations, but our next one that will be up will be by Wesley Bickford. So Wes, if you get yourself ready. Great. All right, our fourth speaker of the day is Wesley Bickford, and he's going to be talking about microbial intervention of for phragmites management, progress and possibilities. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Jason. And thanks everybody for, for sticking around today. This has been a really, really good session. I was I attended the morning session and this one as well. And there's um, lots of good stuff. I really enjoy these, these Phragmites uh, symposium because I learned so much, even though this is the the plant that I uh, focus on all the time. I'm always constantly learning new things from the rest of the field. So it's really, really great to be a part of this. Um, I'm gonna spend some time talking today um, about uh, another, um, another line of research that we have going on at the USGS Great Lakes Science Center, um, looking at innovative control technologies. And this, these, uh, this line of research focuses on the microbial aspect of plants and plant invasion and trying to understand you know the role there and how we can control them better. I'd like to um, recognize my co-authors Kurt Kowalski uh, who you just heard from and then also Jim White from Rutgers University and Keith Clay from Tulane U University and also recognize that the funding um, came from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So as Kurt mentioned um, in a slide that looked remarkably similar to this, um, uh, and, and as we've talked about for a lot of today, um, we all in this audience know about the current management strategies for Phragmites, con conventional management strategies. You can spray it, you can flood it, you can cut it, you can burn it. Um, and all of these, these strategies can be very effective in the right places. Um, and, but we all also know that there are challenges associated with these. Right? So they're resource intensive, not species specific, and they treat really the, the, a symptom of a problem or they treat the, the, the Phragmites itself, but they don't really get at the underlying causes of invasion. Um, and so we are, again, looking for new tools in the toolbox, as, as Michael said and as Kurt said, um, this is really what we're after is just having a few new tools that managers can apply to maybe that may be more effective in certain situations. So we've turned our attention to the role of microbes um, and trying to understand um, how microbes are interacting with Phragmites and if there's some possible control strategies there. Uh, I, I think it really uh, helpful to uh, just uh, think about what we understand currently about the role of the human microbiome. Um, as this cartoon uh, points out, um, there's really a diverse uh, assemblage of microbes in our bodies currently, um, and they're doing all kinds of important stuff for us. And, and a, a really striking stat is that there's about the same number of bacterial cells in our body as there are human cells. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, they also are uh, really important for, for uh, a number of functions uh, in our body. You know, we think about our uh, keeping our gut microbiome healthy because microbes are really important in food digestion, but they're also so, so important in immune responses, um, regulating hormone levels, and also um, resistance to diseases. And the current kind of understanding of what we know about our microbiome is that the appropriate community of microbes kind of keeps us healthy and maintains our bodily function. So thinking about you know, this, the human microbiome, it, 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 we can make a corollary to, our, to the plant microbiome, because we know that plants are also associating with microbes um, throughout their uh, life history and throughout many tissues in, their, their, uh, in, in, in plants as well. So they're in the stems, they're in the roots, they're in the rhizomes, they're in the seeds, and they also have enormous impacts for the plants as well. So they're, um, they're helping the plant gain access to nutrients. Um, they're, uh, they have uh, benefits that include um, tolerance to stressors like drought or uh, high temperatures or, or uh, salt conditions. And so they're enormously important to Phragmites and other plants as well. 
And this is a line of research that's gotten a lot of attention recently, especially in the agricultural community, because you know, if these microbes are so important to the productivity of plants, um, people in, in the, the ag science are thinking about, well, can we um, enhance some of these benefits to you know, get better crops? Uh, so we're taking that idea and we're kind of you know, putting it on its head and saying, well, actually, we would like to control these plants. So can we disturb these microbial communities to better control Phragmites and, and potentially other invaders? You know, the idea being if the uh, appropriate community of microbes maintains a uh, healthy function in a plant, that if we disturb it, maybe the plant gets sick or does not function properly. So let's take a step back and think about how microbes could um, potentially be drivers of invasiveness in plants. Um, I like to think of this in a very in very simple terms that you know we have there are good microbes and there are bad microbes associating with with plants, and um, all plants are going to have some community of, that includes good microbes and bad microbes. Um, but that assemblage, the way that those communities are structured, are going to kind of give you um, a, a different overall uh, uh, um, uh, function of the microbiome, depending on how many good and bad you have. So if you think about an invasive plant uh, and a native plant community of microbes, you may have uh, potentially more of the good microbes than the bad in the invasive plant, and potentially more of the bad microbes than good on the native plant. And so this is a really simplified uh, um, uh, simplified um, uh, concept here that would make this invasive plant, you know, have um, a benefit from its microbial community, where the native plant has uh, is uh, has a detrimental microbial community. And this is, but it's an important way to think about this because if we're thinking about developing controls for um, invasive plants surrounding them, um, the microbiome. We can be looking at this in two different ways. So the potential microbe-based controls can be either to disrupt the good microbes in invasive plants or enhance the bad microbes. So we have kind of two avenues to, to work with. So we know that, that plants are surrounded by microbes in their leaves, stems, roots, rhizomes, and soils. Um, and so the questions that we started developing um, when, we're, when we first started out thinking about this several years ago were, okay, what do we know about the good microbes in the system? Who are they? What are their benefits? What's the magnitude of the benefit? Like how much do they matter? And then can they be targeted for control? And then also what are our off-target effects? How are other plants gonna be impacted if we start controlling microbes? And similar questions for the bad microbes. Who are they? What are their impacts? Um, and what's the magnitude? Like how, how much do they uh, uh, a pathogen impact a plant? And then can they be targeted or enhanced potentially? So this was a really big, these were a, a big bunch of questions that was kind of like too much for one uh, group of, of researchers like uh, at the USGS to um, uh, tackle ourselves. So we created this multi-institution research collaborative uh, to um, address this question collectively. Um, so we, were, we wanted to identify microbiome research gaps. So what do we know about Phragmites and its microbiome? Um, and then also point towards novel micro-based micro -based management strategies. And in the beginning, we had around 10 researchers, mostly microbial ecologists um, that were focusing on, on these ideas. Um, and we set up a kind of pathway to get to control where we're thinking about um, these, these questions in this way. So we're saying, what do we know about Phragmites and symbiosis currently? What gaps exist in our understanding? Um, and, and focusing on those gaps, we can start to create a science agenda and say, okay, well, let's you know, systematically tackle each of these, these science gaps, these knowledge gaps, to get a fuller understanding of, of the ways that the microbiome is impacting Phragmites. And then so we can kind of craft individual research projects that address those gaps and move forward towards this goal of this micro-based Phragmites control that we're working towards. So you see the star next to the science agenda because this is something that we were able to put together. Um, we had a, a really nice product come out of this, a, a paper in Frontiers of Microbiology with all of our, our the co-authors on that paper being part of this uh, Phragmites Symbiosis Collaborative. 
and um, uh, developing um, this, this paper that's been heavily cited, but also is kind of our guide now um, to um, uh, develop new research into the Phragmites microbiome. So in the paper, we, we put together this, um, this uh, science agenda. And the brief version of this is just that, well, if we start with our goal, which is micro-based Phragmites management approaches, and we, we then go back to the very beginning of what we need to, to know, um, we start with identifying the microbes that are influential to Phragmites, who's there um, uh, in various compartments of the, the plant um, and you know, different types of microbes that may be present. And then determine the roles that are played by those microbial assemblages. So what's the overall role of the soil microbiome in certain locations? Or um, what do fun fungal endophytes generally do in, in leaves? And then we could we can target those relationships for either control or enhancement, whether they're um, good or they're bad microbes for the plants. And then, of course, we need to test the effectiveness and feasibility of, of the methods of control in the field. So how do we scale it up? Um, also involved in that is thinking about um, regulatory considerations um, moving forward. So along the science agenda, each of these steps had these kind of targeted research projects that were associated with each of them that kind of helped feed into the next step in the process. And this is how it was designed. And this is actually we're, we are still following this kind of path towards this goal of micro-based Phragmites approaches. So this uh, collaborative has been uh, active for about seven years now, um, and we've been working on these microbiome research gaps. Um, and and uh, through this collaborative, we've, we've published around 15 papers to date, uh, most of them um, looking at either microbial inventories of uh, the of Phragmites, so uh, looking at various scales, so um, um, we could culture uh, microbes from leaves or seeds or uh, roots of, of these plants, identify them, find out what bacteria are present, what fungi are present, um, and uh, then we can look at, at functional assessments. So some of these papers have been looking at what are the functions of individual microbes, what happens when we inoculate um, uh, sterile seedlings with individual microbes, how does that affect their growth and development? And all of this research then has been focused on uh, getting to a control. So we, we're, uh, after we're you know, kind of finding out um, who's there and what they do, we're trying to um, make sure that all of the researchers in the collaborative are, are laser focused on, the reason we're doing this is to find a control for Pragmites. So I'm gonna give you kind of a, an overview of some of the things that we've found so far. Um, in our microbial inventories that we've done, we've looked at um, fungal endophyte communities, and these are fungi that live inside of the tissues of Phragmites leaves or in their roots or um, uh, in the stems. And um, we found that these are actually very diverse communities, and some of them are um, playing roles in uh, protecting against pathogens, um, and some of them are just kind of there um, and are, uh, you know, waiting for the plant to die so it can consume the dead material, that sort of thing. Um, but it was an interesting study that, that found that um, there are numerous uh, uh, fungal endophytes found in Phragmites and kind of vary by location. We've also been able to do some micro, microbiome comparisons, comparing Phragmites, what's, what's found in and around Phragmites to what's found in and around other native plants. So there was a, a study recently that came out of Tulane University, um, someone associated with our collaborative, um, that looked at the uh, soil community uh, surrounding uh, invasive Phragmites and the soil community surrounding uh, native plant communities in the same region and found some striking differences that, uh, that the, um, the uh, bacterial communities surrounding the um, uh, Phragmites patches was different from that surrounding the, the native plant communities. So this suggests that the, either the, the Phragmites plant could be altering the microbiome um, as invasion progresses, or that there are uh, certain microbes that are uh, in the soil that are benefiting um, the Phragmites uh, plants over the, the natives. Um, my work as a PhD student, I just finished my dissertation last year at the University of Michigan, um, focused heavily on um, comparing the invasive 
of Phragmites to the native Phragmites and, and looking at their, their microbial communities. Um, so we did a whole lot of work there that found that um, uh, those microbiomes of the plants themselves are not um, strikingly different, but as invasion progresses in the uh, invasive uh, uh, Phragmites, you do start to see differentiation between the native and the, the non-native patches, suggesting that it could associate with other microbes in the soil as the invasions uh, progress that then could benefit it down the line. We've also looked at various functional assessments as I talked about, and we found um, we have individual studies that found that, um, that fungal endophytes found in seeds could accelerate seedling development. Um, that fungal endophytes in roots may increase salt tolerance on the salty coasts, um, and that, uh, that, that uh, uh, microbes in the soil may improve nutrient acquisition um, in, in most conditions around surrounding Phragmites. So yeah, so that last topic that I talked about, about um, uh, improving nutrient acquisition. This is obviously a, a good microbial relationship, right? And so um, that's, this is one of the things that we've kind of targeted for our uh, uh, one of our management strategies that we're working on testing right now. So we're working on this control that's focused on disrupting mutualisms, specifically those in the soil, and specifically those that um, may be involved in, in nutrient uptake. So these are non-toxic treatments that we've been applying. Um, these are um, things that you find as preservatives and like jellies and jams, these are organic acids, or even sugars as treatments that can disrupt microbial communities in a way that may alter nutrient uptake. And um, so we've been able to see some really striking results um, of these treatments in the field where um, you see these treated pots here on the left-hand side and the untreated on the right, um, where the, it, it may be hard to see on your screen, but the treated plants are all brown, shriveled up and, and dead. And you'll notice below is a, is a um, picture of the, the root mass where you can see that the, the roots are um, stunted as well. The root growth was not nearly as, as significant as it was in the untreated plants. And so um, these have been really effective. And now what we're kind of working on is trying to pinpoint the mechanisms, try to understand what it is about these treatments that's, that's killing the plants. Um, and I want to share some, some thoughts on this. And, and you know, we're, we're thinking about nutrient uptake and how it, it may be really vital uh, to a plant like Phragmites. Um, uh, you know, past research suggests that Phragmites is really heavily nitrogen dependent. Um, and really needs to uptake lots of nitrogen to be able to um, uh, produce that large biomass. So um, it, you know, it could be that nutrients are, are, have a really, really important role in Phragmites development. So these, these um, um, symbioses that affect nutrient uptake could be super important. So I wanna focus in on what might be happening here. And I showed this diagram before about all the different microbes that could be associated with the plant, but we're gonna focus down in the soil and what we're calling kind of vaguely rhizosphere microbes. And this could kind of blend from rhizosphere to kind of bulk soil. So close to the root or far away from the soil. But we're thinking about soil microbes. Two here. minutes. Okay. Basically what um, we're, we're doing in applying these, uh, these treatments is blocking these, uh, symbi these symbioses, one where um, uh, Phragmites may be taking up nutrient-rich microbes or nutrients from nutrient-rich microbes uh, directly. And by applying these organic acids, we're kind of blocking that. And another one where um, these rhizosphere microbes are feeding on soil organic matter and then releasing plant available nitrogen that is then taken up by the plant. And by applying these sugars, we may be kind of distracting the microbes into um, working on these sugars that, that don't have nitrogen bound up in them, and then taking away that plant available nitrogen as a source for the plants. So these controls have been focused on um, uh, nutrient uptake, and we're hoping to scale up to field trials um, next summer. So I hope you take away from this is that microbes are a really understudied aspect of plant invasions, and that microbial disruption can be an effective and novel control and could translate to other invasives. Um, and provide these new tools for managers we've talked about. So with that, if I have any time for questions, I, I can take them and here also have my contact information here. So Wes, we don't have any questions and I think we're about out of time today. Perfect. Thank you. So that concludes our symposium on um, future directions and research for 
uh, Phragmites. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, you can make contact with them. You can send them an email. And thank you very much.